Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the F10X Academy. My name is Timothy Fair Matthews, and we are here to uh, interview Ramez, who I think has just dropped off the stream. So this is a, a good start, but no, well, I'm sure he'll be back in a couple of minutes. But anyway, I hope everyone is well. Um, just to give everyone context to who Ramez is, Ramez is the CEO and founder of the Academy for Sales of Excellence. He's been in the region for about 30 years and he's been doing sales for about 30 years as well. He's uh, trained hundreds of thousands of sales professionals over 38 different countries. Um, in 1994, he started his own uh, multi-million dollar company in Puerto Rico. Here he is back again. And uh, sorry, I was just introducing you, mate. Sorry we lost you there. That's <laughs> fine. No worries. I was just saying that you, um, in 1994, you started uh, your own multi-million dollar company in Puerto Rico and Costa Rica, where he built a result, revolving sales force of more than 400 sales professionals, which is pretty impressive, mate. Well done. Um, and today, Ramez focuses on sales leadership development programs and sales consultancy. So you're based here in Dubai, like I am. Um, and you're also a professor of sales leadership at Holt International Business School. So Thank you so much, mate, for coming on board with the talk. Um, how, how are you, first of all? Is everything okay? I'm doing great, Tim. Thanks. It's also a pleasure to uh, be here and uh, contribute to the community that, that you're building. I'm very proud of what you've done, uh, especially over the last few months, quick and fast. Oh, well, you've got to pivot. You've got to pivot quick, right? The time is now to do your best work, which I think is a little bit kind of what this talk is centered around. So um, it's it's amazing to have you on board. So guys, just to let you know, Ramis is um, not only a good friend, but he's also uh, taught me a lot of amazing sales tips. So this talk is gonna be completely centered around what to be doing right now, because I think Ramis, you, you've, you've highlighted that the sales techniques have adjusted. I mean, they've not changed, but they just, they're, they're obviously being tailored a bit more. Um, so we're going to go into a, a bit of that in the talk. Um, but first of all, let's let's find out a little bit more about you, mate. What, tell us how you got into what you're doing. Um, and it'll be great to kind of um, see see the journey up to where you are now. Well, um, let me just shut off WhatsApp, okay? <laughs> so it doesn't keep beeping in here. No um, worries. 31 years ago in May 1989 was when I first bumped into the profession of selling. I had moved from Lebanon to the U.S. And two years after I got there, I decided to find me a job and make some money. I didn't actually thought that I'd be finding a job in sales. I just went out there. I, I came back home, told my dad that I got a job as a marketing executive with an international marketing company. He goes, OK, son, what are you going to be selling? I said, knives, kitchen knives. He's like, geez, couldn't you find something else? And I didn't know any better. You know, my friends would make fun of me, would say, hey, you look sharp today. <laughs> You know, oh, God, with, it's with, such with, easy. With the thing, yes. and, um, but then I just followed through, you know, I just did what I was told and, and what I was told. And, and I was a good student, to, to say the least. And little, little by little, things started to, uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, build up for me. And maybe when, when I discovered, um, when I discovered I was, um, I was, when I discovered basically my passion, I found myself in that profession. Long time ago, Tim, I don't know if I told you the, the story. When I was in Lebanon, I, had, I was sitting once by myself and, and I had this voice said inside of me, said, you know, what are you going to do when you grow up? I must have been like six or seven at the time. Um, and I just had another voice said, you're going to help lots of people. But then I was like, but I'm in Lebanon. How am I going to do that? And then that voice went silent for quite a while. And then here I was uh, in the U.S. and, you know, selling knives. And um, because of my success, my manager would use me as a, as a, you can say, as a model. He'd say, look, if Ramis can sell knives, anyone can sell knives. And Ramis, why don't you come and just give us some of, some of your tips? So a lot of time people are resistant to the idea that they are in sales and they find a sales job just until they can find the other real job, if you know what I mean. Like they usually want a job in marketing and, and sales is the transition thing. So many people are there, but they're not there. Mentally, they're not there. They're physically there, but they're not doing, doing their best. So I remember the first time I gave that, I gave a speech. I stood up and I just, you know, gave a five minute speech. I didn't think much of it. But at the next sales meeting, a young girl comes to me and she said, Ramis, I just wanted to say thank you. I've made my first sale. And she's showing me like an order form. 
I didn't want to look at the order form um, per se. I thought she stole just a knife. I didn't want to embarrass the poor thing. So I said, good job. She's like, no, no, look. And she shoves the, the order form in my face. This is my eye prescription, by the way. <laughs> you know. And, and she's like, and she's and I, and I I had to take the order form away, and I started reading line by line by line, and she had sold more than one thousand dollars worth of these knives. Now that was more than any order I had made. I was completely shocked. I said, "Geez, what did you do?" She looked at me. She said, "I did exactly what you told me to do yesterday at the meeting." And it was at that time that I had this warm feeling on the inside that got me addicted to sharing what I was doing with others. And little did I know, you know, Tim, there are six ways people learn. And I learned this, the, you know, the, the hard way. First, we learn by listening, we learn by watching, and we learn by doing, right? But also we learn by getting feedback. So I was always there with my manager, very open to having him see what I'm doing, him giving me feedback. But then we learn by reflecting. So me sitting down with myself and saying, what went well in this meeting? Even my car, when I, when I sold or didn't sell, I'm sitting in my car, I'm thinking, what did I do well? And then what could I have done better? Even when I've sold, I do that so I can register what went well, right? And then when, when, then when things didn't go well, I say, well, what did I, you know, what could I have done better? And I would register what maybe worked better on rapport, better listening skills and da, 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 da. But then here's number six, and I didn't know that, but that's like, this is the biggest joker. If you can do this, then you are pretty much getting yourself set up for success. And, and that is the sixth way that we learn as humans is when we teach what we know to others. And when I started teaching what I know to others, guess what happened? The whole thing got accelerated. So because I had failed miserably, I was not the best sales rep you know, out from the you know, starting gate. Um, however, I stuck with it, uh, and uh, just like the Chinese bamboo, which takes five years for it to even show, to grow more than you know, five to 10, 15 inches above the ground, but within the following uh, 10 weeks after the five years, by keep watering it, it shoots up more than you know, 20 meters high or something along those lines. So was it the, the, the 10 weeks after five years, or was it the five years and 10 weeks that made it made it shoot up. And of course, the answer, uh, the answer is in the question. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's what happened. And, and, then, and then little by little, I found that I wasn't just good in selling, but I was really good in helping others. And the more I helped others, the more I would feel this positive uh, jolt on the inside. And, you know, there are different types of personalities out there. And one of them is the giver personality, where you want to give more to others. And and, but that's funny because the more I gave to others of what I, what I knew and helped them succeed, the more uh, came back to me. And that's, in a way, the principle that I've learned a long time ago from one of my mentors, Zig Ziglar. And uh, the basic quote is, uh, you know, uh, selling is, is, is helping someone get what they want first. And eventually you get what you want. And it didn't only work for me in sales, but it also worked for me in leading my teams. So when I was when I was leading, so I, you, you mentioned I've built a multi-million dollar business, and and that's again selling knives, direct sales, door to door. That's like you know prospecting, presenting, number of appointments, follow ups, uh, you know, you know, number of leads. I mean, this is just the whole, the whole, the whole direct sales cycle. You know, having a a, a couple of million dollar business, uh, four hundred sales reps, and it's an evolving sales force, meaning. Uh, revolving, meaning it's not it's not the same people. It's recruiting, recruiting, and you know some drop off, and and but having a system in place that can generate that for a period of what ten years. I was in the island of Puerto Rico, breaking the the double, you know, multi million dollar numbers. You know that's uh, that that's quite thing. So whenever I was even teaching others, you know, even today as my clients, you know, sometimes when you you know people go people go to business for the wrong reasons. If you go to business because you want to make money, well, that is not a good reason to go into business. However, if you go into business because you want to really help other people, I'll give you a story. Um, you want to help other people. People will then pay you what you what you are worth. They'll pay you because they're getting value. Um, can I share with you a small story of how I learned that lesson at age 21? No, please do. Please do. So here, here I was, I, I made a business plan as a, as a direct sales rep. So I was a sales rep, assistant manager, um, and then I became a branch manager, which is a summer job for students. 
So at age 21, I made a territory research in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I figured out, I think I'm paraphrasing now, I think there must have been two to 300,000 inhabitants in, the, in that little town, and um, still good enough for me to go and sell, sell some knives or recruit some students so that they can do what I did. So I went out there, and the first few weeks, I had 25 students. I'm thinking, if everyone can sell $1,000, geez, that's $25,000 a week in a month. That's 100000 Do the math. It just works out. See, the numbers look good on paper, but man, it doesn't always happen that easy in real life. So nice. you feel, and that was an independent contractorship. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't employed by this company. I put, at the time, I was what? I was 9, 21, 2021. 20, um, I put uh, you know, 1000 or $2,000 in cash, and the company gives me $2,000 in cash. So it was 4000 That was my, you can say, my capital to rent an office, find me a little studio or a little bed space I can stay in, you know, and, um, and then put some ads, hire a receptionist, and then get some students so that we can run the cycle. And then within the first like uh, seven, eight weeks, I was $10,000 in debt. And I remember sitting in my meetings and telling the guys, guys, go out and sell. You can do it. And pff, nothing was happening. And my manager came to me, said, Ramesh, we're going to shut down your sales operation. So you don't recruit and, you know, forget that. Just go out there and sell. You recover the money. I said, you know what, Tom, I can, but I don't want to do that. That's not what I became a branch manager for. He goes, well, why did you become a branch manager in the first place? I said, because, Tom, I, I wanted to help people. He looked at me. He said, Ramesh, are you were you helping people over the last you know, eight weeks? I looked back, I said, mm, I don't think so. I had this flashback telling the guys go out and sell and I'm thinking I gotta pay rent, please go out and make it happen. <laughs> or or uh, you know, um, go out and, and, and sell so I can pay the receptionist, go out and sell so I can put more, so I can pay my, uh, you know, you can imagine I was doing it for the wrong reasons. You did it for, make, you did it for making money, which is not what you just said a second ago is the, the motive. Uh, Absolutely. So when I realized, this is again reflection, this is the power of, you know, having a coach, having a guide, someone that challenges you and Tom at the time, it's like as if you took a bath and and in a way, I woke up right there and I'm thinking, geez, I know I can fix this. And from that moment on, I went back to the office and I wasn't, I was like, forget about me. Let me do what I used to do before, which when I was in my district manager's office, I was always about helping others. I'm thinking, what, 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 why did that stop? And it's easy. It's easy to get caught up. It's easy yeah. to get caught up into this, into this thing. And, and when I, so basically I went back and I started, you know, getting to know people and it's like, okay, so why, why are you selling knives? And I had a guy saying, you know, because I want to buy a dishwasher or I want to buy, sorry, a fridge for my parents. Imagine somebody wanted to buy a fridge for his parents. I said, well, how much would the fridge cost? You know, $500, $600 at the time. It's like, well, let's figure out how much you have to sell so that you can make the $500. And we found a way that he can not only buy a fridge, but he can buy a fridge and he can buy a few other things like a washing machine. And, and, and now when I'm talking with the guy saying, man, hey, tell me how's the washing machine and fridge coming? They're like, man, I need to make more focus. So it, it became the fire came in on the inside. And that was just the, 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 the thing. And it's always about, it has always been about helping other people get what they want. And um, yeah, and, and, you know, someone saying the importance, you know, the importance of why. And if you imagine this why was way before Simon Sinek started with his why, you know, promoting and marketing it. And it's been a great reminder for many people because people need to remember that if, you, if your why is big enough, your how will come. If your why is big enough, your how will come. How is what action you're going to take? How you plan to overcome whatever difficulties or challenges? Because let me tell you, we're going to face them, whether we like it or not. I face them. I keep facing them. But every once in a while, uh, you know, I think, you know, three months ago when this thing, when this thing came and I'm thinking, we're thinking, why? Well, I know why. Because, I, you know, it was about reaching and finding ways of becoming available to more people. And that's what happened. It's amazing, bro. That's a great story. Honestly, I mean, the, what, what, the first time I heard this saying, I don't know if it's your saying, I mean, but you said when you when you actually grilled me and you tried to say what is selling, I remember that very clearly. And, and you and yeah. you obviously we came to the um, you told me that selling is to serve. And that's what it is. Just the, the, the ties into that story. You just said immediately there. It's not about the money. It's not about that's not the goal. The goal is to serve. And, and I guess that goes for everyone's clients as well. It's got to, you've got to think, how can you serve your clients and your customers the best way? 
That's what selling is. Doesn't that feel more ethical? And many people think about sales as this, you know, sleazy or this uh, conniving industry. And you know what? Unfortunately, many people who, uh, you know, who who were in it for in the short term have built the wrong reputation. Now, at the same time, I'll tell you, there is research that I've, you know, I've, I'm, and as, as I teach at universities today, many students want the science, you know, want, want to know, well, what's the recent science around, um, you know, around um, uh, connecting with people, around influencing, around persuading. And I don't know if you know this thing, but the concept of serving, in order for you to serve, what must you do first? We need to know what they need. No, of course you gotta. So you gotta ask questions. So as you ask the questions, there is a certain level of, especially if you're asking questions and you're paying attention to what your client is saying, you then can rephrase what they're saying. And I don't know if you've been in a retail situation and someone is asking you what you want, and then you say what you want, but then they're like, okay, and they answer you completely opposite of what you asked, and they're like, and you're like, no, that's not what I said. This is a, what is known as a. Um, a cortisol moment. It's a stress hormone that actually puts two people apart, right? So here you're saying, I'm, I don't like this guy. This guy is not, is not listening. Okay, maybe I'll give him a second chance. And you say, no, no, it's not what I want to say it again. And they're like, go a different direction. And you're like, okay, I had enough, <laughs> you know? So this is called, a, a, there is a stress hormone that is released when there is this misunderstanding. Now it becomes pressure. So if I'm pushing you on something that is not what you want, this level keeps uh, keeps growing on the inside, and and then and then and then you just want to walk away. How long do you stay in front of someone if what they're saying is not connecting with you? See this. It's, is, I, I I heard of it. You, you on a on a good sales call, you should probably not. I think we had another talk the other day. They're saying that you shouldn't be talking for more than about twenty percent on the call. Well, you'd agree with that, right? It's about. There is a time to talk and there's a time to listen, uh, whether it's 20, 25, 30. But you got to understand the two the, the, the two third ratio. We have one mouth and two ears. Do the math. So 66 percent listening, you know, 33 percent talking. So, so somewhere along those lines. And unfortunately, Tim, there is so many people that know this, but they don't do this. And that's what I. That's the, the, the topic of this is ignorance is not an excuse. So maybe you didn't, you know, maybe you knew this, but you weren't doing it. Now, what, what is it going to cost a person if they ignore this simple principle? Did you know that you'll be putting more pressure inside of the client that repels the client as opposed to attracts the client? Now, what I, on the other what, what, what I find, I mean, it's, it's so true. I mean, a lot of this, it seems so obvious. I mean, if you were, I, I think it was you again that shared a story where imagine just, I mean, we've all been in a situation where we walked into a store and then a sales assistant's approached us and it's been, can I help you? And it's that pushy, like, okay, what answer do I give? I don't know. I've just walked in the store, like, leave me alone. As opposed to the, Hello, welcome. I just let you know I'm over here if you need anything. It's just the yeah. language is it's miles apart. We've all experienced it and we've experienced it as the end user. And we almost don't take how we feel and how we experience things and apply it to ourselves and how we sell. That's the thing that just baffles my mind. I don't I mean, it's, and again, when I was going through your course, um, there were so many things. Where it was just like, this is so obvious. I know this. But I mean, do you find that's quite a common trait with people that they forget? The basics with this and, and the language and knowing when to talk and listen and just to remember what it was like being the end user absolutely and i'll tell you normally you know you know when they forget this i'll tell you when they forget this when maybe it's um you know in normal times it's like the 20th of the month uh, they are maybe behind the sales target they get a call from their boss or their manager and says hey we are beyond we are below our target you got to go out there and sell you know they're like there's like get this little kick in the butt and they forget that in order for them to get what they want they have to help someone get what they want first and now when they go and they go and start pushing people and if yeah. i'm pushing you, what do you do you push back and i push you more you push even back and it's like a cat if you corner a cat in the corner and then try to the cat will scratch the same thing with humans right so again it's it's um i'll share with you a story it's um, and that's just building on 
on what what you are what you're saying. Very simple. This is a it's a Sony phone. See the cover for the Sony phone. I had this phone now for almost four years. It's a it's a good phone. It still works. But my first cover died. Maybe you know after three years, bye bye. Khalas, it's done. <laughs> it's dead. So I went to start, I went to Carrefour. I went to a few different kiosks in the malls, and I asked, "Hey, do you have a Sony phone?" And almost everyone said, "Oh, that's a that's a Sony phone. We, we don't sell those." Of course, they stopped selling them in the part of in this part of the world. Uh, but that's an old phone. Why don't you look for a, for a new phone? I'm like, "No, I don't, I don't want a new phone." And they're like, oh, "Okay, fine." And, and that was the end of it. And and almost everyone didn't want to build any relationship or any rapport or even ask me, you know, that's a great phone. You know, what do you like about it? And, and you get to understand, am I a camera buff or am I a, a, a business person buff? And, you know, maybe you can start asking me questions. Do you find it being stuck sometimes? What's going on? And if they would have dug a little bit, probably I would have given them something because, yes, it has issues, you know? But it's, a, it's, but, it's, a, it's, a, it's understanding if someone's ready to buy or not. It's the buy readiness scale, isn't it? It's if someone's coming to you saying, I want a phone, the sale's easy. But many people are, f are not Correct. experienced enough to deal with the cold lead. How do I build the rapport? How do I build the trust? How do I, how do I add value and serve them enough to know that I'm not here for the motive of just money? Right. Then if someone, if I come to you, I tell you I want a cover for a phone, what should you be your main focus? You should give me the cover for the phone. And while you give me cover for the phone or while you're trying to help me, you know, this willingness to help connects with the buyer, right? Mm. So, you know, if you can find a way so that are, you know, so before you can buy from someone, there, there, are, there are stages. First stage, right? Of course, um, just before you buy, trust is high. So if you trust the person, fear is gone. There is no fear. Fear stops someone from buying. Well, how do you even get to trust? Before you can get to trust, you know, you, you got to spend a little bit of time with the person. And it's hard to spend time with someone if you don't like them. So liking, the principle of liking, and that's, again, science. If I take this phone and I drop it, there is something called the law of gravity dropping the phone. Where in science, according to Dr. Robert Cialdini, there is, a, in his six laws of influence, one of the main principles of, influ of, of influence is the principle of liking. And how do you build liking? Well, find something in common with someone, right? Mm -hmm. You find, uh, you, you, um, you make, um, you give a sincere compliment. Oh, that's a great phone. Man, that's, and if you know anything about the phone, it's a, it was way ahead of its time when it was released. I mean, you must, so again, and then the other thing is make someone laugh. So if you get, if you, so how do you expect someone to even continue having a conversation when the principle of liking, you know, is ignored? Now, let me tell you a complete, so this, I walked out of every single one. I ended up buying this for $6 on Amazon. I didn't need a sales rep. And this is a story I give a lot of my students today and even a lot of my clients to say, what is the future of selling? Will we need sales professional? And in this example, there was no need for me to interact with a salesperson. The only way a salesperson is needed is to add value in the sales process, which let me give you a simple story. So here I was running out of Carrefour, I wanted to go to see my brother. Uh, it was his birthday on February 11th, and, and I'm late. I'm late for, uh, for dinner or for lunch, or for, um, for lunch, right? And I walk into this beauty store. I'm thinking, let me buy my brother some perfume. I had this flashback, and a long time ago, maybe 35 plus years ago, I bought my brother perfume, and he made me a comment. He's like, thanks for the gift, but you know, I like only one kind of perfume, so I never bought him perfume ever again. So I was afraid that I, I go in and I buy my brother the wrong perfume. It's like, ah, it's not a really good gift. I want to make it nice. So what I do is the guy is there, the salesman is looking at me, seeing things, and he throws the wrong comment. The, he, he said, if you want, sir, we can put your name, we can engrave your name on the bottle. I told him, Habibi, this is not for me. This is for my brother, and it's a gift. If I engrave his name and he doesn't like it, I'm stuck. But here's what he did. He said, he said, oh, it's a gift. I think I can help you with that. I was like, okay, what do you, what do you mean? He goes, you can pick any, any perfume here for your brother. I, I will give you small samples of the exact perfume. So before your brother opens the bottle, he can smell what's inside. And I'll give you 
five, six, seven other small samples of any of the other bottles that we have in the store. And now you give your brother the option to buy this, to keep either keep it or to come back and exchange it with any other, you know, smell that he wants. I was like, man, you got it. Tell me wh what can go wrong. So this, this person, at least he listened, he understood my needs, he understood my goals, and he took away fear. The investment was, you know, five, 600 dirhams. It's not a big investment, right? And I was in a hurry. It was a good, good decision. I made it. Boom. Sale made. But at least this dude was able to listen, understand, and then offer me the right solution. And maybe one of the things I, I shared the story with many of my audiences, and I, I tell them, are you trying to sell at your customer? Are you trying to sell them just talking at them or are you talking with them? By talking with them, so it's a give and take, it's understanding and then trying to think of ways of adding value in the sales process. That's amazing. Did your brother like the gift? No, no. He he told me I, I really appreciate the the uh, the different the different you know, smells, and I went and I bought another smell, which I was very happy that he at least kept this perfume. So now I know next time uh, I'm in a hurry, I can do the same. <laughs> oh God. Well, I mean, it's, it's still that's an amazing story, Ramis. Thanks for sharing that. And you know, this something I want to pull. I want to focus back on. You mentioned something earlier, which really stood out for me you said that a bamboo takes five years before it gets before it even starts sprouting is that right but then yeah. 10 chinese. weeks after that it can grow up to, sorry say again it's the chinese bamboo chinese bamboo so i mean in a way you can kind of see that with almost the compounding effect of just investing your time in anything really can't you it could be fitness it can be you know developing your business and, and all the other bits and bobs and i think if we focus on a sales approach here i think I'm speaking to a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of businesses on a daily basis. And I don't think really people are thinking about sales enough at this stage. And I think going back to this whole topic of that ignorance is no longer an excuse. Where are you seeing the mistakes being made with the people at the minute in this climate? And what are they, what are they not doing that obviously is going to take such a long time to compound into something? What should they be doing? What are the mistakes that you see? So, that's a really loaded question, Tim, and I, I, I'm just going to rattle off a few things. N number one, this part of the world that we live in is so forgiving to not having great sales skills. So I've been in the Middle East. I grew up in Lebanon, but I've been educated and had my business in, the, in North America. Um, when I came back in 2004 and I started going out, I was working with Unilever Food Solutions, one of the you know, Fortune 500 organization. I was the head of sales training for Asia, Africa, Middle East. I went out to more than 30 plus different countries. And that's in 2004. And I observed sales professionals and I, under, I speak four different languages. And, and I, observe, I even I observed them in languages that I didn't speak, like in Turkish or Chinese or, 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 or uh, you know, different levels or different types of Chinese uh, dialects there. But one thing that I realized is that, my God, people are not even following, uh, not even 20% of the principles of, of selling. And the only reason why they were selling is because uh, the, the, the industry that we were in is a booming industry. There is a demand for these products and, uh, and you show up and people buy. Now, it's not just that, but this has continued up until the first uh, big bang or big recession of 2008, 2009. And, and that's when, when, when the company, so we as Unilever were always investing in making our people better while others were not. But now customers had more options. They needed to justify the premium uh, that they were, they were going to pay. And, uh, and if you had the basic skills in place, then, then you, can, you can defend or you can reposition value. You can reposition, why am I paying more uh, for this product, not the other product? So the biggest thing I've seen is this market has been forgiving for all these years. And even, even yes, it has, it has become less forgiving, but then there are the cycles ups and down. And, and what normally happens is the entrepreneurs, the business owners, especially if they are the creator of the business, there is something inside of us that is known as mirror neurons. So if I'm looking at you, Tim, 
and I believe in something, just the way that I look, my facial expression, your unconscious mind picks up on these things. And your unconscious minds connect with, with the other person unconsciously. And because of your beliefs, because of what's going on on the inside, I, I am the owner, I am the creator, I know this, is, this stuff is good. There is all these unspoken messages that gets actually transmitted on non-verbally to the other individual that non-owners and non-business people or the, the, the non-owners or the non-creators of that is very hard for them to do because they don't have the same background. They don't have this knowledge of value that they can bring to the client. So I am talking here at the unconscious level, but what does that mean for the average person? So what, mean, what it means is many businesses end up relying on just the owner to sell. And when the owner hires one person, two people, three people, and they pay them a salary for six months, nine months, a year, they can't bring one or two deals. Well, what does that tell you? There's something wrong. So sure. many times they say, well, I hired this guy and he had 15 years experience. And in my book, it's like you could have a million years experience. But if, you know, but in that, in that period of time, are you using the same thing that you did, you know, back in year one? Are you doing it for 30 years? So you have one year experience repeated 30 years, which really it's one year experience versus a complete evolution and improving on your game, right? So, um, so the biggest mistakes that, I, that, that I've seen, and, and you know what? Today, the market has become even less forgiving. So while people in the past were relying on the market and the demands for their products or service to come from local market, et cetera, what we're finding today is because the world has become more flat, more obsolete, right? Um, uh, you know, the ideas that used to work before are no longer working now and clients are searching for solutions everywhere. And they yeah. are finding solutions in, in everywhere. So now, if I'm a business owner, entrepreneur, and I don't have my basics covered, if I don't understand what does it take for me to be able to show value, right? So at the end, Tim, let's just say, you know, um, God forbids your, you know, your, uh, your best friend, uh, you know, breaks a leg, right? Would you want to take them to the cheapest doctor or would you want to take them to the best doctor? The best. It's it's again because obviously if I value the relationship so high, I wouldn't want anything to go wrong. Of right. Uh, and if you think about it, the shirt that you're wearing, did you buy it because it's the cheapest shirt or because you felt that it had better cotton, it would last longer, it would, it would, it would. Well, it's it's a lot of factors. If it looks good on you, it feels good. I mean, yeah. I mean that. I mean the the cheap. I mean buy cheap, buy twice. I'm a big I'm a big believer of that. Big believer of that. Right isn't cheap and something cheap isn't good although there is logical reasons why we buy of course there are emotional reasons but when you combine the two of them people are logical and people are emotional so the the, the question is in order to get to someone's uh, to someone's uh, heart you got to go through their mind first because the mind when when you 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 engage the mind the hormones get released and now we're talking on the oxytocin level, the, the hormones of, uh, of empathy, the hormones of feeling good about something, the hormones when you put on a jacket, you like it, you're like, man, you know, someone tells you, you know what, that looks great on you. It's actually it's a great sign. You know, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's made for you. When someone says that to you, it feels good. And if it's a sincere, it's a sincere thing. So um, these are, I would say the word, this is not new territory. However, it's becoming more relevant, more today, it is, it is, it's just not acceptable for a business owner, for a sales professional, not to know these things and not to apply them. If their livelihood depends on it, man, then they are really uh, gambling with their, with their future. You know, my, I have a saying, if I am a tennis player, how, how do I practice? I practice by hitting the tennis ball. If I'm a golfer, how do I practice? I practice by, you know, using my club. If I am a basketball player, I practice shooting hoops. But if I'm a safe professional, how, how do I practice? I, I practice by, 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 by practicing, by speaking, by asking, by listening, by, by understanding where am I with this client on this journey of awareness, consideration, buying where, where 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 am i where am i and where are they along this journey gone are the days 
that you can pressure someone into doing something. You know, I guess, I, guess, I mean, one, one of the questions I was going to lead on to is, do you think people right now in this climate are ready to be sold to? And I think you just answered it because it depends entirely on the situation and what you're selling. But I think people are, you know, I mean, what would you say to that? If someone, so, so the concept of being sold to, so in other words, can you force me to buy something? The answer is no, you cannot force me to do anything. You can only help me realize the gain, the, the pain or gain. The pain, if I don't do this, what will happen? And if I do this, what will happen? And if these, the outcomes is important for me, then I am more likely to consider this, uh, this idea moving forward. I think today, more than ever, you, you don't want to push your product or service to clients. What you want to do is you really want to be empathetic. You want to be able to listen to clients. You want to help them realize um, that it's not the end of the world. It's just a rapid shift. And if another shift happens, are they ready to, to take advantage of it? Um, to me, I think, you know, whenever we teach the principle of negotiation, especially the collaborative type of negotiation, the first thing we do is, is if we can find common goals, if I can find a common goal with my client, if we can have a common goal, a common objective in terms of what are we both going for, then we can figure out the detail. But if there is no common goal, is in other words, if I want you to buy more than you want to achieve a certain business goal or objective, then, I, then you don't care about me wanting to buy. What you care is about your goal and your objective. And this, this time, the, one of the best ways for us to engage with clients is through storytelling. Stories are what inspires people. Stories are what motivates people. Uh, and I mean, I'll just give you an example. I was running a, uh, a, an influence and persuasion course at, at HALT, at you know, HALT International Business School. This is a course I did in San Fran just a few weeks ago, um, finished uh, last week on Thursday. And uh, in one of the practices, I gave students a tough scenario to go and motivate staff. I said, you are the owner of this retail outlet and, um, and you, you, know, you, you, you own a you know, $50 million business. Uh, it has gone almost, it has lost 70% of its revenue over the last three months. Uh, you've done 30% of business mainly because you have a dinky website. Uh, a dinky means it's not very good. It's like uh, non-responsive. Uh, it's not uh, mobile friendly, but still your products were so good that 30% of people still are going and giving you business, buying your stuff on, online. And now uh, things are coming back into place. Just have the opening speech and you have in front of you 500 people. What would you do? So some, some people went through the logic. You know, guys, uh, um, you know, we, we are doing well, uh, we could be doing better. And you're talking here to the logical side of things. It's, it's, it wasn't too inspiring. But I had a guy, his name is uh, Barisan Ege. Barisan Ege, so I'm looking at his name now because I have still here the roster of the students in front of me. Um, he's like, I, you know, he's, he's, he's from Turkey. And uh, he, he started his speech with a story. He said, guys, I got I to gotta tell you, something that happened to me more than, you know, seven, eight years ago. He's a, he's a, young, he's a young chap. And I'm going to paraphrase the story, but it was like, when I was growing up, I, my father threw me in a swimming team. I failed the first time, second time, but the third time I barely made the team. And I would go to practice, I'd go to practice, and, and I'm, I'm always there hanging in there, hanging in this process. But then one time my dad comes to me and he goes, buddy, son, you know, What's the point of going to practice if when you go to practice, you don't give your best? And Barisan said, when, that, when my dad said that to me, I realized, geez, what's the point? If I'm going to practice, I'm not giving my best. Well, why am I going to practice? So guess what happened? Barisan started to give his best. So he said, so I started to give my best. Now, little did I know, but I started winning. I started beating the other kids. Uh, I started, I got my first medal, second medal. By the time I finished high school, I had like 27 different medals and records in, this, in, in, my, in, my, in, my, in my area. And then came the trials to go to the national team. So guess what? I tried and they got me. Next thing, I'm in the Olympics. And, and, and guys, 
I and then you know he's he's paraphrasing and he goes he goes. This is my story about me swimming. Let me tell you about our story. Before this whole thing started, we didn't, you know, we were just doing this online thing. You know, we were just doing it. See if it, if it works. But what just happened is there was that thing that kept us going. We wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for that. My question to you is where in our other departments, we're barely keeping things alive. We're barely, we're just showing up. We're not giving our best. Now, I don't know about you, but if there was a time for us to come together and to show the rest of the world what can this chain do, this is it. Yeah, so true, Ramaz. That's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've been saying this as well. I think the time is now to be really doing your best work. If it's, I mean, we were talking a little bit before this live came on, guys, and we were talking about how some of the huge benefits I think this whole um, coronavirus period has done is it's highlighted. Not only cracks in the foundation, but it's sort of made us reflect a lot more on the impact we're making, just as a company and as an individual. Um, you know, again, going back to the bamboo reference, like whatever you do now is going to compound and take time to grow. I'm, I'm speaking to a lot of people that are saying, you know, we're working harder than we were before, and there's no money coming in, but you know, you just got to keep at it, haven't you? And I think it's it's just finding ways to add value and just you know just stay in there because th this is not going to last forever but you know whatever you do now will compound into something great especially if you're serving you just got to keep the value value first as you say how can you serve value first. especially now tim many people ignored this online world so i'm in the learning and learning and development field and many of my clients prefer to have me live there's nothing wrong with that you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the only thing that's that's happening is now this has accelerated the need to be able to provide value, mm -hmm. this live value for clients. Um, to get me live is limited. It's a scarce resource. However, you can get uh, Ramis through other channels. So having built my online platforms, my online courses, and my online uh, programs several years ago, maybe I was a, a little bit, um, I hedged against this one, this one, this one risk. However, today, if people, entrepreneurs, business owners, we are in the knowledge economy. We are in the, in the age of information, the, the age of knowledge. And today, this is here. You know, knowledge is, is up here and keeping it here serves no one. <laughs> you got to find a way to bring it out to the uh, you know bring it out to the to the public and that's where you again some people have this impression that overnight they'll have a million followers it takes long long time and very precise actions in order to achieve such such things however you can do a lot with a few thousand people with your community at least connect with your audience with your clients that you have live make sure that you're adding value to them so they don't go elsewhere because they know you like you already have done work with you find a way to serve them in this new channel because if you're not going to serve them they're going to go somewhere else no, that's completely true. It's ethically selling, isn't it? I mean, right now, we, we have been talking a bit about people being like sold to in this climate. And I think people are more conscious of now where they spend their money. They're very conscious of their next investment. So this has given us all the opportunity to almost sit down and think, is my product or service relevant? Is it, eth is it ethical right now to sell what I normally would sell? Um I mean, I, I, I know some people have, have have had to pivot. Like, even for us, we were a production entity doing very high budget, you know, commercials and stuff. And, and this is just not appropriate anymore. People just don't have the budget. So it's got to be completely different. Um, you know, some, some business, I think, are able to weather it. I mean, how, how many people do you think you've noticed in your community, Ramis, pivot? Have many done that? Or do you think some people are still stuck in that point? Where, where do you see the trends? Look, every company, every product, service, or business is in business because they are solving a problem for their client. Now, if at the core, the problems have changed, that means your product or service that you're selling is no longer needed. You got to find new problem and new services to, uh, to, to, uh, to sell because it's about helping, it's about serving others with what they want. So some of the clients I work with are within the food industry. So 
of course, you know what happened to the hotels and to the restaurants, which the hotels business went down to zero. And if you're selling food to the hotels, if that was your only channel that you're selling to, you had no business. So several of my clients, big ones, uh, shifted from selling to hotels and restaurants and food outlets to actually creating uh, recipes, uh, cook at home uh, with your spouse type of a thing, work on certain immune boosting recipes, et cetera, where they, they utilized their networks to be able to make restaurant quality available at, the, at, your, at, your, at your doorstep. So they've shifted, they've pivoted in terms of the channel. The products are the same, their warehouses are full, people still need to eat, and they have to pay their suppliers. So they have to find a way to connect what we have, what they had in terms of food with, uh, with, the, with clients. So that is one simple example. I also know of another, another example. Um, you know, one of our common friends, Namita, works with a lady called... Uh, uh, um, she has the soap, um, this camel soap business factory. What's her name? Uh, Lomas. Um, I, the name will come back to me, but this, you know, this lady's mother was, you know, she, she's built this factory around uh, Expo 2020 and her thought is more than what, 25, 30 million people are coming to Dubai and they'll walk back, they'll go back with some camel soap. It's not bad if you sell 25, 30 million bars of soap, <laughs> you know, so, so now she had all this stock, stock sitting there. What do you do with, uh, with all this, you know, stuff and, and you can't do much except shifting, uh, going into creating small, uh, what you call um, gels, you know, small sanitizers. So, you, think, you know, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it is about, it's about shifting. It's about realizing what are the new problems that my product or service is solving. I, I'll tell you one thing. So um, before COVID, before COVID-19, even the way that I would speak with clients, so the way I speak with clients is like, do you know how, you know, so part of what is known as the elevator pitch. Do you know how, so, so how, how do you, how do I grab attention? When someone asks me, I'm as well, what do you do? I say, well, thank you. Thank you for, for this question. Let me, let me just, you know, explain. Uh, and, uh, and I would start by something like, do you know how, um, you know, after the first, you know, after the recession or people are finding it harder and harder to sell their products and services because salespeople are more order takers than order makers. You know, they're more reactive than proactive. So what I do is then I help uh, sales professionals to, to, to connect it up, be more proactive in making orders as opposed to re reacting. Now, if I say this right now, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, well, what do you mean? Now, let me tell you how this whole conversation shifted. Do you know how now during COVID-19, many businesses stopped selling? Sales professionals are panicking in terms, they're like more conscious about their price, about their value, and they're re rethinking about everything. So what I do is I help work with sales professionals to adjust their mindset, to realize the value of their products and services during this situation and show how, so, so they can show their clients how they can help them achieve bigger and better goals. So I work with them during these difficult times. So just this conversation shift makes what I do more relevant. So if you're still having conversations, so, so that's part of the, the elevator, elevator pitch workout that, that we've launched. You know, this is one of the small products that we've pivoted. You know, we've made this available and said, okay, people today need to realize how can they speak about their products and service because it all begins with, do I want to have a second conversation with you? It's not like, hi, how are you? You want to buy. It's like, hi, how are you? So visibility, you got you to build awareness. You got to build this level of uh, trust. So you, you get first people to realize, you know, that this is a capable person. And then when you build enough trust, you can uh, possibly do business with them. But people are, are just ignoring this very simple reality. So yeah, you, you got you to be careful. Try not to sleep on the first day. It just doesn't work, does it? <laughs> You can sleep in, but man, you better wake up with some energy and do it and do something positive with it. If you just sleep in and give up. See, a lot of time people give up in their mind before, uh, you know, before they give up in reality. And of course, if you give up in your mind, then you've lost the battle. And, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, our sales <clears throat> success formula. Um, if I can share here with the, with the audiences, this one story, my son, <clears throat> my son who, who studies sports uh, sports conditioning sports uh, 
uh, rehabilitation. When he was finishing his undergraduate, I don't know if you remember that story, Tim, he's, he came to me, he said, Pop, where does strength come from? Uh, he, I felt he was really eager to tell me what he's learned in school. I said, I don't know, you tell me. So I didn't want to pop his bubble. So, so, I, so he goes, come on, Dad, strength is mainly neural, partially hormonal and structural. I was like, what? Talk to me in English, please. I didn't follow that. He's like, think about it. If you want to move something from point A to point B, where does strength come from? I said, my mind. He goes, strength is mainly neural. I'm like, okay. And then he goes, well, your mind then orders or activates certain hormones um, to activate your muscles, so partially hormonal. And then your muscles use your bone structure to push you forward. And I was like, darn it. This is like, this is really my son. And he actually learned something <laughs> in university. And the same I had found, Tim, um, with safe professional. Where does safe strength come from? Well, safe strength is mainly neural, right? Mm -hmm. We call it the, the mindset and the beliefs. Do you talk to yourself? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And now during COVID-19, what is the story that you're telling yourself? So if at the core, your story is a losing story, nothing you can do that will change because customers will read through you just as when I was standing up in front of my salespeople say, guys, go out and sell. They're like, this guy doesn't believe in us. He just wants us to go out and sell. Forget about it, <laughs> you know? So mainly it's mindset, right? Beliefs, mindset. Then we have, uh, you know, partially uh, hormonal, which is activation. Something that activates is activity. So it's SAM, sales activity management. It's about seeing, it's putting the actions so that you see enough people. So whether it is two business development calls a day, it's not following up, but two new calls, you can follow up as many as you want, but you gotta find two new people to speak with every day, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last is about the sales engagement. Now, this is more about, you know, you connecting, you understanding the science behind how to build rapport, be, be behind how to ask enough questions, how to summarize, um, you know, find ways to connect with your clients so that the sale becomes a natural, I would say, a natural progression of this whole thing. It's almost a really good, that's a good habit. I like that, two business, I mean, what are the habits do you think businesses can adapt right now to improve the situation? What other things can you share? Look, um, in, in order for you to achieve success, it's, it's really about um, getting in front of people, getting in front of the right people. So uh, you talk about habits and, you know, selling is a habit, the way that you, uh, you connect with people, the way that you reach out to people, the way you network with people. Right. So these are all habitual. Actually, 45 percent of what you and I do is Habitual, the way you drive your car, you don't think about it. It's, it's you know, the way you eat, the way you brush your teeth, the way you, you wear your clothes in the morning, the way you, everything. I mean, 45% of what you do is habitual. Imagine if selling becomes habitual where you have the right habits to achieve your outcomes. Instead of every, imagine how stressful if, if let's say you're playing basketball. Is that a habit? You know, if, if you're playing, if you're playing uh, football, is that is that a habit? Of course. If, you know, so imagine if every time you get on the field and you have the ball, oh, what do I do? What do I do? It's, it's not it's not a habit. So this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot of business owners and they're like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? It's like, man, there is a process of actually driving sales forward. If people are happy with 10, 15, 20 percent conversions, well, and they've built a business before. Well, today, 10, 15, 20% conversions is not sufficient because unless you drop down your overhead drastically, right, that is not going to cut it, right? Wow. Someone is getting 50, 60, 70 plus percent, 80% conversions. Well, if they are doing it and you're not, well, what's stopping you? So how do you make the 60, 70% habitual? How do you make that a habit? and not the other one. So people habitually are used to that 10, 15, 20%. And, and if, if that's what they're used to it and they like it, that's great. But today, if that's the case, well, you know, it, how much money are they leaving on the table? But more than the money, how many customers that they could be serving and they're not because, because they were not able to actually show them the value. 
of why work with them and not work with somebody else. So I think if not for you, do it for your customers, man. You know, gotta get serious. It's not an excuse to continue doing the things. You know, I have a famous quote, and you know this. If you, you know, I always ask people, if you keep on doing what you're doing, you'll keep on getting what you're getting. Have you heard that quote before, right? And I ask people, do you think this is this is true? Isn't that doesn't that make sense? And many people yeah. say yes. And then I have always one or two that are like, oh no. I was like, okay, what do you got there? And and then people start realizing one second the world is changing. Competition is increasing. And there are more technological advances today than there ever was before. So there are more opportunities. If you keep on doing what you're doing, you will no longer keep on getting what you're getting. You're going to get less and less and less. This is not the first time I say that. Today, this is the first time maybe that even I have realized that I cannot afford not to be doing more things online. I, if, if I have ignored this in the past, right, guess what? If I ignore it now, it's going to be more, it's going to be more violently, um, uh, I would say it's a violent mistake. It's a, it's a deadly mistake now more than ever before. Now, if I would have done more things before, I'd be in a much better position today. But here's the thing. Is this the last time we're going to see change happen this fast, this drastic? I don't know. I hope it is, but sincerely, I don't. Yeah. And the, the thing is, I don't want to take a risk. Do you want to take a risk? If you do nothing, well, you are taking a risk, aren't you? So, yes, it is time for, you know, Ethan is saying, time for that big shift. I think, um, you know, it's time for the, big, for the big shift for us internally. You know, us as people, we deserve the best. We deserve to be... Uh, I think my message, my story, my my ideas can help a lot of people. I know I've helped lots of people in the past, uh, and and um, and now is about let's say taking it even uh, to that next level. And same as you, and you know, again, I'm really really impressed him with the um, with the swiftness of taking action and finding the right partners and being able to build value for uh, for your community, man. Well, I couldn't have done it without the team. And I think that's something I can say from experience is that you will go further and further further with a team as opposed to a, opposed to alone. Collaborate and lean on your network. And I think, you know, just to sum up, I mean, we're not going to wrap it up yet. I want to go through some questions, Ramez, but just to kind of highlight what we highlight for anyone that's just joined us. Um, you know, it's we, we really picked up, uh, went on big on you need to add value um, when you're when you're selling. It has to be value focused and serving the customer. Don't use money as the motive. Um, network enough so that selling becomes a habit. Huge one. That's a, that's a really good one. And I think, you know, little things that you say, make the calls, a couple of calls a day, just get used to it. Make sure your product and service is ethical. Um, is it relevant? Is your problem still fixing something? And if it isn't, you shouldn't be selling it. I'm a big fan of that one. Um, and just being proactive. The time is now to do your best work. Really, really good points there, Ramis. Thank you so much. I'm going to quickly shift through some questions because I think there was a few that popped up. Anyone listening, if you'd like to put in a few questions, we do have a few minutes left with Ramis. We can. You're okay to stay on the call for a little bit longer, Ramis? Are we okay? okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So anyone, any, any sales question, guys, please pop them in now. Um, so let's have a quick look here. Got a nice little comment from Shivani here. She said your course is very helpful. Um, she's telling some of your workshops on Zooms. Which is nice. That's a nice one. Um, let's have a look. Here. So we've got another one from Edna here. Do you think sales should be taught in high school? We all know how to do it as we hone our persuasion skills through our lives. But do you think sales is a gaining better reputation? Because it is. We talked a bit about that. Sales is a dirty word. Um, so good. It's good that you're teaching an ex executive MBA level, but maybe we need to learn earlier. I mean, I'm a, I, I completely agree with that. I don't think school. You know, I think school is incredibly dated with the curriculum that's in there. I think it, it it doesn't prepare us enough as it used to. What do you what do you say on that? How would you answer this? I'd say the earlier if a student or the earlier a person is is actually exposed to the right principles of selling, the more likely it is that these skills and these behaviors will remain with them for the rest of their lives. And and I was very fortunate. I was 19 when I started learning. 
uh, about sales. So, um, so again, the answer is yes. I'll, I'll give I'll give you here a small story. I when I was teaching the first time, I taught a sales class maybe four years ago at Halt. And um, one of the things, or one of the reasons why I teach at Halt is because that is a very, I'd say the word relevant school. That's their mission and vision. We, they want to be the most relevant business school. And the way they do that is by preparing students to be ready on day one. So when they graduate, they should be ready to face the real business challenges and real world scenarios. And, and that's where we felt that, you know, people, you know, it was a sales, a sales profession, sales job, sales something, uh, is the number one job that students are being offered out of executive MBA level, even regular MBA or master's. So if you're an, at an executive level, you're a director of sales or VP of sales. If you're an MBA, you're a sales manager. And if you are a uh, at the master's level, just uh, finishing you know school in your mid twenties, you're a, an executive, a key account manager there. So 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 this is what we found and. They Hulk gives students every graduate of Hulk can come back for one elective every year for the rest of their life. So they're like into a continuous education, uh, continuous learning uh, process. And I had this student come from Saudi. He runs, uh, you know, a seven, eight figure uh, uh, operation. So, uh, you know, maybe like 80, 90 million dirham or, or Saudi real business. And he came, he said, you know, professor, I asked him, why did you come take this class? He said, you know, I took the, the MBA, the executive MBA, thinking that I need to, to run my business, I have to become better at operations management, or I got to become better at finance, or I got to become better at strategy, or I got to become better at, uh, you know, all these things. But I realized that I can know all these things, but until I become better at selling, my business isn't going anywhere. And he, he it's came pretty crucial, yes. Yeah. It it's without, without, without sales, you can't work. So, I mean, yeah, it's pretty fundamental. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I guess that's right. That you just need, I mean, I, I'd agree. I think it needs to be taught the soonest that you need more time to practice. It takes a year. I mean, how many years have you been studying this and doing this and practicing this? Yeah, it's been 31 years. And, and, and I'll tell you, um, if I would have kept the knowledge I had 31 years ago, it's still, it, it, it would be very obsolete today. Because selling in the 80s, 90s is different than selling in the 2000s and 2010s and now in 2020. So today, it's not just about regular sales. It's about social selling. It's about building relationship online, offline. So it's really having this multi-channel way of speaking and communicating. And uh, in a way, you're building your brand. So, so again, even retail sales professionals today need to do something online and not just wait for the customer to come in, but you got to find a way to engage, to educate, to add value. So, uh, so selling, you know, life in general, you, if you, the moment you stop learning is the moment you stop dying. And let me ask you a question. How much money you spend on groceries per, uh, per uh, I don't know, per week or per month? I'll make it simple for you. You know, maybe about a thousand dirhams a week. So you got to eat a thousand dirhams a week. If you divide it, it's maybe twenty five, thirty dollars uh, on a daily basis. Do the math. So just as you are, you are investing, you know, twenty five, thirty dollars every single day to have food to keep you alive. Well, what are you investing to keep your your mind alive? You know, so. Uh, so again, if you're if you're just having mental candy, you're, you're just listening to to music and enjoying yourself all the time. I'm not saying don't do that. Of course, you got to have some time to uh, to uh, to uh, unwind. However, if people invest, you know, even a few dollars a day, you know. Uh, no, it's, I, I love I love that analogy, mental candy. I think that's great. It's moderation. Yeah. It's like everything in moderation. You've got to feed this with the right nutrition. Otherwise, you won't get results. As you say, if you feed this, you, you feel your, you put money in your mind, your mind will fill your pockets, as you say. So true. Many years I ago, have, um, I, sorry, sorry. Go on. I, I was saying there's something called the EVE ratio, E-V-E, -E, e -V -E. it's called education versus entertainment, education versus entertainment. If, if people can do this simple exercise, it's, it will take you five minutes, but it will change your life forever. Just on one side of, you know, take, take a paper and, and divide it in half, right? So you divide it in half. Let me see. Here is half. Here you put how much money you spend on education and how much money you spend on entertainment. And just, you can, you can write down and maybe, uh, I don't know, Netflix, uh, uh, you know, eating out or 
coffee, muffin, you know, it just puts down how much money you spend on being entertained and put how much money you spend on being educated. And um, what has happened is it's normally a one to 50 or one to 100, meaning for every dollar people spend on education, they spend 50 to $100 on entertainment. And under entertainment, you put going on vacations, you put, uh, you know, the plane tickets, you put all this time and, you know, and you think how much time and money you put on educating yourselves. And today, many entrepreneurs are investing on reskilling and upgrading. And, and unless you're, you're doing that, uh, unfortunately, the end is near. No, so true. Absolutely so true. I mean, and guys, like we have the internet at our, our disposal. This is not the Spanish influenza where we were in a very dark time with no internet. We have got a wealth of information available to us mm -hmm. through a mobile phone. Um, got a couple more comments. I saw a really uh, interesting one here. I'm not sure who this is from, uh, but it says, so I have a question. I've been trying to keep in touch with the client. And one thing that demotivated me was a comment from a client saying, do you see the times we are going through and you're worried about your business? Maybe some of the advice on how to tackle these comments. And I think it's the same person here saying comments like this really makes me think, am I doing the right thing? So I think that's a really, that's a really honest, thank you for ever put that question. I think that's incredibly relevant. What would you say to that, Ramesh? Look, I, I, I think this maybe is a sign of the wrong type of follow-up. In yep. other words, if I'm following up with you and I'm just being completely insensitive to, uh, to your needs, to your situation, I will get a comment like that. A comment like that does not come when you have trust, when you have rapport, and when you really want to serve the other person. It doesn't come. So this only comes when you're trying, you are a taker as opposed to being a giver. So what I would tell this person is, I think, you definitely would want to apologize with the client. You'd want to apologize to them and say, you know, sincerely, I, I did not mean it that way. Uh, of course, uh, I care about I care about you as a person, and and uh, you know, I'm I'm calling to uh, to you know, to apologize about the time that you felt I was being I was pressuring you. Um, and uh, look, man, I, I just want to see how how you're doing. So a lot of time when you give someone a call and just say I'm sorry, it kind of throws them off. Like, what do you mean? Like, oh, okay. Well, it wasn't that bad, and and they kind of soften their their tone, and then and then uh, you know just don't don't talk business. This is not the time. So you want to hear? You want to rebuild trust? You want to say, hey, is everything okay? Uh, what are some of the things that that you need? What's going on? And you know, one of the easiest way to end up fixing this is find a way to give them something they want. So if you know that they are, I don't know, if they are a dentist, well, refer them a business, refer them a friend who has a broken tooth or who has a cavity. So, you know, let them know they came on from your behalf and now you are finding ways to contribute, to add value to this person. Um, I, I had started a series of webinars. We did this series. Uh, we had like six master classes of uh, people, uh, uh, you know, helping people how to sell and pitch in difficult times. And I started this back in March 27th, I think. Uh, I had a poll and I asked three questions. The first question was, you know, do you find customers have more time to talk to you than before the COVID-19? And 78 or 80 percent of the people said yes. The other question I asked is, do you find customers have, are, are being more, uh, more um, empathetic? Are they more understanding, more courteous? And another 80 plus percent people said that. Um, and then my question was, when was the last time we had 80% of customers wanting to know, having more time to talk with us and they were nicer to us? This is golden. So don't call to take, call yeah. to connect, That's call to build yeah, relationships. And I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, a small, you know, when I, when I shared that and then one of my follow-up coaching session, I had a guy who's selling to the construction industry who called the purchasing director of a big, uh, of a big, uh, you know, a big, uh, a big contractor and, or a big um, developer. Sorry, that was the word I'm looking for. And this guy was, the, this purchasing director was not his regular customer, but he called him up. He said, you know, I just, Wanted to say hi. I haven't talked to you for for, for a while. The client was just like, "Oh wow, you give me a call. This is great. You know, uh, I'm good. Thank you very much." He goes, "Actually, my I'm trying to call the sales rep 
from my supplier, but he hasn't answered my, my last six phone calls. I actually need business. Can you, if I send you a PO purchase order, can you send me this stuff? So I didn't call you for that. He goes, no, no, I, I, I want to give you this business because you, you called me and, and I wasn't even expecting you to call. So these are yeah. the things that happen when you keep a warm type yeah. of relationship. I think that's true. I mean, I think the same user just commented back saying, I've done that. He was shifting his business online and he's complained that he was on the verge of closing. So, I mean, I, I guess just to bounce and feed some some advice on my end as well. I mean, from my experience is that a lot of people can be in a different position at the minute with where they are mentally. Some people are obviously in a real, real scarcity mindset. Some are probably not thinking healthy. And, and I think that there's nothing wrong or that there would be no negative side effects, probably just having the how are you phone call. Um, and just saying, you know, how are things? How are you doing? I'm not here to sell, just checking in. I think that's always a really good approach because you can then easily, I think you'd agree, Ram, as you can gauge the situation better then. And, and obviously that can always naturally progress into something that is a little bit more more relevant. Um, I've got one. Um, there's a couple of other questions that's popped up. Sorry, we're running over a bit, Ramiz, but obviously everyone's uh, enjoying your talk. So that's good news. Um, so we've got one. To, there was a Jas Karan. Vin Singh, are cold calls, in your opinion, still viable? I mean, we've got Zoom now, I mean, which is a lot more personable. Um, but what what do you think cold calls are still incredibly uh, still viable? I think I think they are. I mean, what do you think? Look, you can you can do anything goes. The only thing is the percentage of success of cold calls is a very small number. Mm. Um, so in again, depending, you know, are if you have a business. I do not recommend cold calls because it's going to take too much. I call it the ERP, effort, risk, and payoff. Effort, it's very time consuming. The risk is very high because there's a high chance of rejection. There's a high chance of things not going well. And then the payoff, if you get, again, depending on, you know, if, if you can, if you're selling a million dollar deal and you get one, you're okay, fine, right? Get 99 rejections, you can care less about it. But to me, um, if you have a million dollar business or you have a million dollar deal, well, wouldn't it be great to get to, to get a hundred clients saying saying yes? And instead of wasting your time on all these these others, find uh, find ways of being with clients where it takes less effort, less risk, and there is more payoff. So the best way forward is many of the warmer type of an approach. So even when I was selling knives, a door to door salesman, I still didn't go cold knocking on doors. I started with people that I knew, and from these people, I would ask, hey, who do you know you think would be nice enough to help me out, um, yeah. right? And you know, okay. even 14 or, sorry, 17 years ago when I came to Dubai in 2004, if I can give you this little story, I, I came to Dubai looking for a job. Like many other people that came here looking for opportunities, this is this is what happened. Um, mm. uh, so, so, so. I have, one, I have one brother who lives in Dubai, and I was living in Puerto Rico running my business. And I wanted to get out of my, let's say, my comfort zone, be able to speak at a bigger level. But I felt, you know what, I've never worked for anybody else. Let me find me a job. So I sent my CV through my brother. My CV lands on the desk of the country director of Unilever in Dubai. His name is Mohammed Saeed. And, uh, and he through emails, that's my brother. When your brother is in town, let him give me a call. And that's not, I'm going to give him a job, but let him give me a call. So I came to Dubai with one lead. All right. I could have sent my CV everywhere, call, but nothing. I had one lead. This is what happened. I walk in, talk with a guy for about 10 minutes. You know, he stood up, said, Ramis, it's been a pleasure to meet you, but your direct sales experience does not work in our retail environment. I said, you know what, Muhammad? I, I felt the same way. And probably I'm not a good fit. He said, exactly. I said, but let me ask you a question. You know, you've seen what I've done and how, how I do it. Who do you know you think can benefit from my, at the time it was 15 years experience, working in direct sales, training and developing salespeople so they can go and do more than what they think they can. He said, oh, well, that would be our B2B, uh, our B2B business. They sell food to chefs, to hotels. It's one-to-one. I said, fantastic. Who would be the person to speak with? He said, oh, that would be the managing director. His name is Kamal Salman. I said, do you mind if you uh, give me his number? He said, oh, no, that's fine. 
He took his phone at the time. It was the Nokia, the one that opens up, and you know uh, he was looking. So he's like, "Okay, here's his number: zero five zero, blah 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 blah." I said, "You know what? Is it okay if you can just dial his number to see if if he picks up?" He said, "Oh, that's a good idea." He picked up. He dialed his. He's like, "Oh, hi, Kamal. How are you? Uh, look, I have a friend of my friend uh, who's here from the U.S. He does direct sales. Can you talk to him for a minute?" He said, sure. I picked up the phone. I said, Kamal, uh, thank you for taking the time. Um, met with Mohammed, and he really felt that you and I should have a, should have a seat to find ways to, to show you how I've helped organization uh, improve their sales working with customers on a one-to-one -one basis. And I know that you have a direct sales business. Um, when would be a good time for us to have a simple, a simple coffee or a simple tea? He said, well, oh, that's funny because we're actually looking for someone like you. Oh wow! Now the power—the power of just asking. The wow. power of asking. I was standing on the shoulder of my brother's referral. So Hamad Said, my brother. Actually, he's not my brother's friend. He's my brother's brother's friend. So look at how that relationship. If there was no trust, and of course, I built myself up. We, we we got off, and up until today, I still see Muhammad. He's moved on, and and we we are good friends. But you know, again, um, ask and thou shalt receive. Ask when and thou shalt receive. Idea. And it's it's also the fact, like if you can be introduced for someone. I think going back to the original question of, is a cold call still viable? I mean, it is. But like you said, it's what you get, it's the risk of it converting. And if you can be introduced through someone that that I mean, we've all been to a restaurant that we go, oh, you've got to go to this restaurant if a friend's recommended it because right. it's come from a good source. I mean, people like to go where they know they're going to get a good experience. If it's right. cold and it's unknown and there's no trust, it's harder. Um, so, so just a couple, right. of, a couple of comments. We had uh, someone say the EVE, love that. That's really good. Um, Seb jumping in here saying most companies spend 10% on R&D, putting 10% of your income aside each month to go towards self-development is a good rule of thumb. So that's a nice little insight there. Um, we've got a couple of questions here from, I think, Ergo. I think it's Ergo. I think I saw it before. Um, what do you think about the future event and entertainment sales as everything going online for all sales professionals? How could they come up with this challenge of an online event as it's completely different of what they're doing before? That's really good. How would you answer that, mate? So I think the, the question maybe has two elements. What do I think about the future event and entertainment sales? So I guess this is selling the events and entertainment business. So selling maybe concerts or selling yeah. um, such, I, such I, events. I believe, I believe Ergo actually is an, has an event business. So I think that's, okay. that's where this comes from. So, I mean, I, I think un until there is a definite cure yeah bless you unless there is a definite cure for 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 this uh, virus thing and the threat is removed the way that people will come together is not going to be the same as it was before now having said that humanity will survive humanity will find a way to come together to socialize to to have this personal one-on-one -on -one touch so i think today you know uh, um Tim, you and I have known each other from before this event, but having this uh, this conversation like this right now, it's almost like we're sitting next to each other and we are you know, having a conversation. So what I can tell you is humanity will survive and humanity to survive needs to socialize. So how many times you've heard people today say, hey, let's have coffee on Zoom or let's have... So still people are doing what they were doing before, but remotely. And and you know what? Until the time where we have holograms being projected through, you know, the through the internet, and someone's being able to sit next to you physically through through a hologram, I think I think th this is this is you know the Star Trek of the future is now. So we're seeing yeah. a lot of these, uh, you know, these um, th this this future um, future way of doing things uh, coming to reality right now. So to yeah. answer you. To answer this question, you got to find a way to solve problems. So events and entertainment solve certain needs, certain problems or certain pain or gain. So people wanted to get out, meet people. They wanted to enjoy, get into, into, into maybe a different environment. Um, and today the question become, 
uh, you know, what are these, uh, how can you provide people the opportunity to solve their problem with whatever uh, inventions, with whatever, um, uh, whatever uh, solutions that, that you provide. The other thing I can tell you, Ergo, is think about the future of the entertainment business. You got to think what, what entertainment would look like in the next five years or 10 years. I don't know, but I think I've said a few things. You know, you have, uh, you have, uh, you know, um, you have this, uh, you know, what was it that I said that I said it? You have the hologram. You have whatever that business looks like. You know, think of that business and find ways to build the business of ten years from today. Today, if you can be ahead of the curve, right? This is then gonna be relevant. So. I think this online thing is here to stay and yep. find a way to accelerate the evolution of your business. And the same applies to my business, the same applies to your business, Tim, and the same applies to, to Seb's business or Shivani's or anybody else's uh, who's here. If we ignore this, how would the future of sales training, habit building, how is that going to change? Well, I know people want on demand. They want uh, they want uh, virtual. They want uh, latest research. They don't want to have just to deal with a guru. They they want to know that this is proven and tested scientific uh, scientific results that get me get me w- what I want. So you want to find a way to keep giving people value, and and they will come to you. So true. Wow. Well, I mean, Seth talks about this. You just got to yeah, look at the problem you're solving. The delivery is changing. Why do you do what you do? What what are you fixing? And the delivery method is the only thing that's changed with this crisis. So I think that's a uh, ties in very nicely. And I think we're going to actually wrap up there, Amis. I think I mean this has been the longest talk I think we've had so far. So thank you so much for giving so much of your time and value. And I think everyone's loved your stories. Um, it's been a, it's been great having you. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and yeah. well, um, I, I I think it'll be great to have you back again uh, soon in the near future for for maybe a slightly sure. different topic, but. I mean, immense value. Thank you so much, Ramiz. Um, how can people um, get in touch with you and what can they do to keep connected with you and, and, and hopefully get more value from you? What can they do? I think the, the, um, the easiest thing would be on Facebook. Uh, you can uh, find our, um, we have a, a group, a Facebook group called the Academy for Sales Community. The Academy for Sales Community is mainly for sales representatives and yep. sales leader. Very soon, we're going to separate these two. So if you're involved in sales, you're a business owner, uh, you have people under you, or you're currently in sales, for the time being, this, you know, the Academy for Sales community is the right, um, you know, the, the right, um, let's say, group to join. And there, you'll have access to some of our uh, closed uh, uh, webinars we've conducted, the master classes, and some of the video snippets that you are creating for us where we're simply adding value to our to our audiences uh, and, and making it happen. My goal is to get this to 10,000 people before the end of the year. Uh, wow. And uh, today we're, we're only at a few hundred and it's building. It just started recently. And I know we're adding some, some great value. Um, then if you want to visit our website, the Academy for Sales.ae, sorry, the Academy for Sales.com. Uh, or uh, tafsi.ae, you can um, you can get to see some of the things that we do. And if you want some uh, some support, you know we have different types of uh, different types of programs where you can get knowledge, you can get knowledge and build habits. You can get knowledge, build habits, and get coached. So whichever level that you you are in, uh, you can get knowledge for free. We have a beautiful online channel. You can get very specific knowledge for a small fee. And you can get uh, better knowledge and and also some some um, some uh, some support uh, and then the coaching and habit building. So different levels, wh- whichever level you, you know you you wanna you wanna go in. Uh, it's you know it's from zero to, to hero. You know whichever uh, whichever amount you want. That ten percent, you want five percent, or you want fifteen percent. That's totally up to you. Amazing. Thank you, Ramez. Uh, I, honestly, I have absolute pleasure to have you on board. And uh, guys, Ramiz is actually in the group. So if you have any other questions, if you're watching this later after it's been recorded, feel free to tag him in. I'm sure he won't mind jumping on and answering any questions. Absolutely. And I tell you, I've also enjoyed watching some of the other uh, speakers uh, that have been on the program. I think James, uh, 
is another sales uh, speaker, sales trainer, James, what's his last name? James Watt, yeah. Yeah, he's really, really good guy. He had some some good value to, to add, plus uh, many of the other speakers that, that you're bringing on board. I think the this type of uh, community is, um, is uh, you know, doing the right thing to add value. So I'm very convinced that value will, will come back. And I can even say something that, Tim, I, I work with you. Uh, if you see some of my videos that, uh, you know, at the, at the, uh, uh, at, at our page, especially some of the snippets, Tim has been responsible for putting those together with his team. And, um, uh, you know, again, very thankful and more of those cool videos will be coming as well. Thank you so much, Ramesh. Right. Thank you, everyone. And th uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, giving us all your questions. We will be having Ramesh back, definitely, for sure. Have a great evening and we'll see you on the next talk. Bye-bye. Ciao.